best time of the year again, and I've been wondering what I should celebrate it with this time. I can't do ice levels since I already did that and my opinion hasn't really changed. Ice Pokemon? Did that last year. Oh, I know this one will work. How about winter themes from a certain franchise? Oh heck no, I've done three winter themes lists. People would think I'm crazy if I did a fourth one within five years, but I eventually came up with one. Top 10 games I got for Christmas. Which you would already know if you saw the title of this video. Okay then, I'm going to list my favorite video games that I've gotten for Christmas throughout my life. Just so you know, I'm also going to list some personal stories I had with some of these games. If CJS0 was able to list off personal stories he had with the games in his November games list, why can't I in my Christmas games list? Now, here we go. Now to start off this list with the game I got for Christmas, and about a short time after I've recovered from somewhat of the half a year long depression I had in 2011, Mega Man X. This is what I think of as the best Mega Man game. Well, actually be honest, probably not since I've only played the Classic and the X series. I've been meaning to get the Zero games and ZX games, but I'm still trying to decide if I should or not. But for now, this isn't just a Mega Man game with an alternate plot, it's three hours of fun. Or like six or ten depending on how good you are at it. You have a cooler design, can dash forward, cling to walls, charge your beam, and so on. Also, I think I like the Mavericks even more than the Robot Masters since instead of looking like normal robots, they're designed to look like animals. As for the music, you have some rocking tunes that you can listen to. Epic songs like Chill Penguin and Spark Mandrill, you can feel the adrenaline from this epic game. Now, if only it wasn't the only good X game. Don't deny it. You're all sick of hearing me talk about this next game. Yes, Wrath of Cortex gets on the list of mine yet again. This was actually the first Crash game I ever played. Even though I had seen my cousins play Crash Bandicoot Warped, I didn't get to play it, but I still thought it looked like fun, so I guess it's probably what led to me getting Wrath of Cortex for Christmas. It has some problems, like the overly long load screens which are actually longer than some of the levels in the game, and the lack of innovation in the Crash series other than having every level have different music, but I guess it is because I hadn't played the original trilogy at the time I had this game. It was a very fun and addicting experience with multiple powers, replay value, catchy music, numerous death scenes for Crash, and fast paced action. Guess it only goes to show that growing up with something can sometimes make you like it more than you should, and you guys would probably be happier if I didn't grow up with it, because then you wouldn't have to hear me talk about it in like half of my countdowns. Yeah. Well, here's a shocker. I didn't expect this to make the list. I was looking through my favorite games list on my iPhone notepad app, and thought of which ones I got for Christmas, and to my surprise, this ranked the highest out of any Kirby game I had gotten for Christmas. Normally I don't play games until I've played every previous game of the franchise that I'm interested in, but I was just curious to play this one, even though I had only played Dreamland, Nightmare in Dreamland, and Pinball Land at the time I started playing this. And, like Wrath of Cortex, I enjoyed it more than I should have. Even though it used so many elements from the past games, like the mini bosses being recycled from the Amazing Mirror, and the multiple abilities with each move, which wasn't unique at all since pretty much every Kirby game since Superstar had done this, it was still a breath of fresh air for me to see the new ability mixing combined with the beautiful style of the Kirby franchise. I was so addicted to this title that I got from level 1 all the way to the final boss in one day. I am still trying to comprehend how I did that. It's not my favorite Kirby game, that would be epic yarn, but this is my favorite out of the ones I got for Christmas. Man, I was late to the party on this next one. But next up is Kid Icarus Uprising. I should have gotten this one much earlier instead of playing it like three months after Chuck Connery's last play of it, and a year after Wee Dude's Kid Icarus Uprising chapters list. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seen a lot of the plot twists coming. Though to be fair, that was my own fault for watching those videos even before getting the game. I still regret that even to this day. But even knowing what was coming up, I made the most of it. The jokes, for the most part, were hilarious. Seeing them destroy the fourth wall and tear apart some of the most annoying cliches in media was something I was down for. The visuals were awesome to look at, the music was ear candy, and even the controls, which people say is one of the few problems, I found to be pretty good. I don't know a single person who hates this game, and I can definitely see why. Maybe someone out there does hate it, but unpopular opinions do exist. And speaking of unpopular opinions... 
Hold your torches and pitchforks, everyone. Just let me explain myself. I get it. You hate stickers there with a passion. I would understand that. But you people are just ironic. Being all like, you can't hate Super Paper Mario for being different? Now excuse me while I hate on Secret Star for being different. Anyways, like I was saying, I got this game for Christmas in 2012, as opposed to on launch date, which I probably should have gotten on launch date, but at least it was still my fourth year in a row, having my first playthrough of a Paper Mario game towards the end of the year. This game's story may not be anything to praise, but with the new powerful sticker moves, dazzling visuals, and more usage of the whole paper aspect, this game is gorgeous! Sure, they took out the experience system and now all your moves have limited usage, forcing you to pick up more of them at all times, but would you rather go back to Super Paper Mario's constant aimless wandering? Oh, well I sure wouldn't. Besides, I somehow got over the sticker mechanic within two days. At least it's more skill based than- Boo, you stink! Maybe it's not perfect, but just remember, there are billions of people in the world, and no matter how badly received the game is, there's always going to be at least one person on the planet who likes it. Next up is a game I got shortly after Mega Man X, and the game I played to start off a whole new year and a new chance to find happiness. The game that revolutionized Sonic 3D, or at least its DX remake, with better graphics and the models that still are a little bit off-putting, but still infinitely more pleasing to the eyes than its original counterpart. Also, it has one of the nicest hub worlds I've ever seen which is one of many reasons it's better than its sequel, to me at least. In Sonic 3, you can only play as three characters. Now we have twice that amount! This made Sonic one of my favorite franchises, and led to me getting games like Heroes, Unleashed, and Colors. Maybe it's still outdated in some aspects, and looking back at it, it's not quite as good as I remember, especially after the cutscenes got annoying after seeing the game being one of the most overdone games to be a Let's Play. But then I remembered that I don't have to watch every Let's Play of this game. Besides, at least it's a much better transition to 3D than- OH MY GOSH GET THAT GARBAGE OFF MY SCREEN! This game will always be one of my favorite Sonic games. I hope. Oh, here's a game that is safe to compliment in public. At last, we have the game that made me the gamer I am today, Yoshi's Island for the Game Boy Advance. While it wasn't the first game I played, it was bar none the best game I had gotten at that point of my life. I will never forget waking up on Christmas morning and taking every opportunity to play this game. I loved it so much that I can remember several places I was when playing it. Playing from level 1 to the Baseball Boys level on Christmas Day, being the Chief of Lakitu's on the way back from seeing Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets, getting stuck on the Don't Look Back level until I finally beat it on my way to Wisconsin Dells, beating the next 6 levels while there, and getting stuck for weeks on the Danger Icy Conditions level until school started again and I was told that the reason I kept being turned into a snowball was because I wasn't jumping over the rock. I wanted to relive those good times. Well, except for the last part about being stuck in the skiing portion. Still, this game will always hold a special place in my heart. While I was scripting this video, I've been noticing a strange pattern of games that didn't get very good reception, and it's time to talk about another of one of those underappreciated gems, Spirit Track. After Phantom Hourglass, I was expecting good things from this one, but I didn't think I'd love it this much. But I think that's partially because it reminds me of a much happier time for me, back in December of 2010, where everything was so much simpler. Back when I could make CDI jokes and get away with it, back when some of my closest friends on the internet weren't inactive, Back where we could go more than three seconds without having to hear everyone spewing an unfunny Trump joke, or seeing that stupid important videos playlist and the related videos of every video on YouTube, I'm still living a decent life today, but I really wish I could go back. But I'm stalling. Let's talk about the game. I also love being able to ride the train, as the atmosphere is beautiful for a DS game, and it has what is tied with Ocarina of Time for the best overworld theme in Zelda, and because the game is overall just a lot of fun. Another reason I love it so much is because Zelda has one of the most useful roles she's ever played. She can possess phantoms in the spirit tower and utterly destroy enemies. If you're a Zelda fan, you should consider getting this, though you might not like it as much as I did, since it might not remind you of a much simpler time like it reminded me. I got Donkey Kong 64 on the same Christmas that I got Spirit Tracks. And I started playing this right away after beating it. 
and this was the game I first played in 2011. I first played it on New Year's Day of that year, which was a happy time that ironically started off one of the saddest years of my life. If I had known how sad that year would be for me, I probably would have savored this game's experiences and enjoyed this game to its fullest like I do now. This game is as awesome as it looks, with Donkey Kong's first, and so far only, 3D platformer adventure. And it has that rareware charm to it, except it manages to be even more fun than the Banjo games. In my opinion at least. How? Well, aside from the personal story I just mentioned, it also has a bigger world, though maybe too big at times, and the bosses are awesome, especially the final fight where you use the skills of all five Kongs you've learned throughout the whole game. That's right, you play as five characters instead of two. Not to mention, unlike in the first Banjo-Kazooie, the game requires you to play a decent chunk of every level in the game this time around. Don't have much else to say, so pick it up for yourself. Good morning! Even though I didn't get Ruby and Sapphire for Christmas, I did get Emerald as a gift from my cousin. We agreed that he'd get the game for me if I watched Monty Python with him, and I did. I was very grateful for this gift he got me, for it was what I loved about Ruby and Sapphire, except it was a lot better. With the ability to fight double battles from being seen by two trainers at once, a feature that for some reason they neglected ever since Generation 5 and only just now decided to bring it back and even then it's only briefly. And this game also had the National Pokédex, allowing you to see Pokémon outside the Hoenn Dex without having to trade for them, and the Battle Frontier which should have been in the remakes. I mean, the remakes are awesome and probably just as good as this, if not better, but Emerald is my personal favorite game in the series. I can't really explain what exactly seals it at the number one spot. I guess it's just that it's a remake of the game that got me into Pokemon and introduced me to a franchise that changed my life forever. And it's just my favorite game that I've gotten for Christmas in my life. So, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night and I gotta ask people for more Christmas countdown ideas. 